Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Geezerology's Wednesday Spotlight. Dan and Bob up in Missouri and myself here in South Florida are here this week to talk about the T-Rex album, The Slider. This album was recorded in March and April of 1972. It was released in July of 1972. This was the seventh album by, uh, by Mark Bolin in, in, his, in uh, the configurations of his band. He, uh, he released uh, four albums under the name Tyrannosaurus Rex with his partner, uh, Steve Peregrine took, and then one with, uh, with uh, uh, Mickey Finn, who replaced Steve Peregrine took. The Slider is the third album uh, after they changed the name from Tyrannosaurus Rex to T-Rex. So this is, this is the third T-Rex album. This is the second album where T-Rex was a four-piece band. Uh, before that, it was just, it was just a duo. Uh, it was just a duo. And uh, the other musicians on this were uh, the drummer, uh, Bill Legend, and the bass guitarist, Steve Curry joined uh, Mark Bolin and Mickey Finn on this record. Also uh, getting credit on this album are Flo and Eddie, Mark Volman and Howard Caitlin, who did the, the background vocals on this record. But uh, they weren't there in, uh, this was recorded. T uh, Tony Visconti was a producer and he and the band recorded this album in, uh, in Copenhagen. But Flo and Eddie were in Los Angeles, and they got the the the, the, the tapes from uh, Copenhagen, and then added their background vocals onto this. Sort of like what everybody does now during the pandemic. Well, they did this back in 1972. That's the only re way they could get Flo and Eddie on this album, without have without them having to travel all the way across the world just to lay down these background tracks. Uh, Flo and Eddie actually were on, uh, I think, two or three uh, T Rex albums in a row. Uh, they later went. They, they, of course, they were the uh, uh, they were the the two vocalists and the Turtles who had some hits in the '60s, and they went on and did a lot of work later with uh, Frank Zappa. Uh, anyway, Tony Visconti was a producer. This the Slider uh, was the follow up to Electric Warrior. Uh, the Slider was actually the most commercially successful album of, of T-Rex and Mark Bolin's career. Uh, it, 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 was, it, was, it was actually a more successful album than Electric Warrior. Electric Warrior is the one that uh, is a more iconic album for a couple of reasons, mostly because of the hit song Bang a Gong, as it was called in the US, it was called Get It On in the UK. And also Electric Warrior was the first album Basically, people credit it now as, as the first glam rock album, Electric Warrior. The Slider basically follows in the same vein as Electric Warrior. It's, uh, it's just T-Rex with these uh, just simple two and three minute pop songs where, uh, where Bolin lays a lot of uh, fuzzy guitar licks on top of it, a lot of, a lot of riffs. It's a very riff heavy. They're very simple songs, very simple lyrics. Uh, the, the, the rhyming schemes were more important to these lyrics than actually any kind of message to these songs or anything. They're all pretty, pretty simple and, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit out there. A lot of them, a lot of the songs, I don't think they mean anything. They just, the words sound good. <laughs> uh, but this was this was huge in the UK, much much huger in the UK than it was in the US. This album actually did reach the top ten in the US, but uh, but two singles that were released from the slider, Telegram Sam and Metal Guru, neither one of them charted in the US. The only single that ever charted by T Rex in the US was Get It On from Electric Warrior. Uh, this this album was. When it was released, I picked it up. I had heard Electric Warrior. A couple of my friends had it. But uh, when, when this album came out, I went out and bought it. And I became obsessed with this album. I just loved it. It's just so catchy and so poppy. And, 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 so, and, and, and it was just so easy to imitate it. Uh, it's, 
it's just it, it's a great album. I, th- I think it's I think it's actually a better album than Electric Warrior. Uh, I think a lot of historians and critics think it probably was uh, T Rex's crowning achievement, even though Electric Warrior is the one that uh, that's lasted longer in our culture. And and uh, when we talk about the history of glam rock, um, one more thing I want to say about this: that here's the album cover right here. That's uh, Mark Bowen on the front. And if you turn around the back, that's uh, <laughs> that's a pretty cool album concept there. Uh, but I wanted to show that in particular because there's this one credit here. See if I can point that out. It's on the inside cover right there. It says photography right there by my finger. It says photography by Ringo Starr. Uh, the story is here that Ringo was producing and directing a concert film by T-Rex. Ringo, Ringo and uh, uh, T-Rex and Elton John were touring together. They did a few, few uh, concerts together. And, uh, and so Ringo was producing and directing a concert film with us mm-hmm. called Born to Boogie. I went and looked for it and you can't find it anywhere. I can't find a copy on YouTube. It's not streaming anywhere. I don't know that it ever got any wide release, but uh, it was called Born to Boogie and, and Ringo was uh, producing and directing this. And Tony Visconti in the uh, intervening years has said that Ringo did not shoot these photos. Tony Visconti said that Tony Visconti shot these photos, but uh, they thought it would just be a good idea to somehow get Ringo Starr's name on the credits of this album. <laughs> so, they, so they just invented the story that Ringo shot these photographs. Uh, uh, Tony Visconti says this, Ringo has never confirmed nor denied uh, as far as I know. I, I looked and looked and looked and looked. As far as I can tell, Ringo has never addressed this issue, has never said whether whether he took the photos or not. But, uh, but anyway, just a nice little uh, 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 trivia uh, piece from this album, which I've always found kind of funny. Uh, I like this album a lot. I listened to it a few times this week. And I gotta say, I liked it. I liked it a lot more back in 1972 than I do now. It's still pretty good. It still holds up, but it just it just doesn't have the uh, it, it it doesn't have the impact now that it did, and just probably because of the simplicity of it. There's there's just not a whole lot to wrap your to wrap your brain around, or you know, it's just it's, it's just a good little catchy kick ass rock and roll album. Um, which you know, this one, and Electric Warrior, again, are are uh, you know, are credited with starting the whole glam rock movement that uh, <clears throat> that dominated the, uh, especially the UK music scene for for four or five years in the early seventies. Uh, it it never glam rock never really took hold here. I th- I think that the the the, the the, the glam rock that did come out of the United States was pretty much referred to as glitter. And we called it glitter rock here, but, but, but glitter rock as opposed to the UK glam rock, the UK glam rock was, you know, T-Rex was just really simple, uh, simple uh, two and three minute pop songs real quick, just uh, sold a lot of, uh, you know, they're just danceable tunes. Uh, you know, Mark Bolin and the others, they, they just uh, promoted their, their, their sexuality. Uh, <clears throat> and there wasn't a whole lot to it. The, the glitter rock in the U.S. was, there's was, there was more darker, a little more violent feel of the stuff. I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, Lou Reed, Iggy Pop, uh, a couple of those. Those, those were uh, that, that. That was sort of the, the darker side of glam. And like I say, they called it glitter here. A guy named Gary Glitter. Uh, but uh, but anyway, this uh, a lot of people attribute this to as a sort of a forerunner to the to the punk rock that that, that started taking hold later in the decade. Just just because it, it brought just a real simplicity back to rock and roll. You know, we, we, we lost all the, all, all the political messaging and all the, uh, 
blues licks and everything that was happening in late sixties, early seventies. And this just went back to basics and just gave us basic rock and roll song. What, what all this was. And this, and, and this is the, uh, this is a perfect example of what glam rock was all about was, was T-Rex with, uh, with the, with the slider. And I think the slider was a little, was, was, was more of a perfection of the, of that art after electric warrior. Uh, Bob, you want to take over? Sure. Thank you, Scotty. Um, way back in the day, I put Electric Warrior and the Slider, you know, in my album collection, and, and they're still sitting there. And that was just based on the strength of, you know, Bang a Gong and Telegram Sam and a few other songs that got, you know, some radio airplay. Um, they're infectious. They're easy to listen to. You said they're very riff heavy. Um, so the music is pleasurable to listen to. And even to this day, if I happen to be, you know, with a classic rock station and Bang a Gong or Telegram Sam comes on, I immediately crank up the volume and sing along with it, you know, because they're fun, captivating songs. But there was never enough substance there to make me really want to dig deep into Mark Bolin and his work either back in the Tyrannosaurus Rex days when he was a hippie, folky, Indian type guy, and even when they you know, went to the glam rock part. So it's, it's fun to listen to. It's great stuff to have playing in the background. Um, my big problem with it is the lyrics. Uh, most of them just don't make any sense. Uh, from what I've read, a lot of it's very personal stuff to Bolin. <clears throat> a lot of stuff he writes about people that he knows, and like Telegram Sam, I've heard two versions. One is a song about his accountant, and the other is about his supplier. So who knows? You know. Um, so it's not stuff that I want to take real seriously, but it's interesting music for the period that it spawned and that movement that it spawned. And you know, from what I understand, at one point T Rex was huge in Great Britain. I mean, they were up there with the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. I mean, you know, you got to have some clout to get a Beatle to, to shoot and direct your documentary. You know, so they were huge there for a couple years. Um, they couldn't sustain it, you know, and then sadly, Mark Boland died in a car crash and, you know, ended his career, I think, at age 30 or something like that. Yeah, it was two weeks but, before his 30th birthday. Yeah, yeah, you know, so, but for a couple couple years there, you know, they definitely ruled. I know they weren't that huge here in the U.S. Um, basically, you know, they're known for a couple of those radio-friendly hits that they had. A um, couple uh, anecdotes. <clears throat> you, you brought up the cover photography. Um, the, from what I read, um, the graininess of those photos, when the film, it was film was shot in black and white, and when it went to the lab to be processed, the person who was processing it was a huge T-Rex fan and was really anxious to see the images. So he took the D76 developer, heated it up so the film would process quicker, but failed to heat up the stabilizing chemicals so when it went into the stabilizer, it didn't actually stop the developing process. So the film came out grainy like this, but actually it wound up being a pretty inter arresting cover despite that mistake. Um, and then the other thing is if you look at the back photo, I wonder if that's where Slash got his inspiration for his top hat. <laughs> yeah, so. That's a reasonable... Uh... <laughs> has nothing to do with the music, but it's interesting <laughs> trivia. <laughs> Um, so like I this say, was, you know, I, was, yeah, to, to get on your on your one point, this yeah, they were they were huge. They were they were they were massively huge in the UK. Mm -hmm. In fact, this was the this was I think this was the second of four uh, T Rex albums that I mean debuted at number one on the UK charts and stayed at number one for weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is the second of four of them, I think. Um, and yeah, they they were huge over there. It, you know, they caught on a little bit here, but but yeah. but never never massively. They were massive in the, in the UK. Yeah. Mark so Mark Bol Mark Bol Mark Bolin was a huge huge. I mean, you know, it's it's like you can you can all you kind of say Teen Idol. I mean, you think Teen Idol is uh, 
is uh, somebody like David Cassidy or Justin Bieber or something like this. So that was that was Mark Bolin for a couple of three years in the in the UK, even though he was he was more of an accomplished, serious musician than a lot of these other guys were because uh, he was he was he was he was more artistic than than teen idols tend to be. But 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 he was huge. He was huge. he was a little guy, but he was <laughs> but his, you know he was a little guy in stature. But his uh, but his his public persona was 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 very 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 big. Yeah. And you say it, it's not something to take seriously. I don't think it was meant. To, it wasn't meant to take seriously. It was it was it was it was it was meant to be catchy. <laughs> well, you know, I, I wonder though if 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 Bolin himself. I think Bolin took himself seriously. The, the last thing that I'd like to comment on the music, um, you know, there's there's some androgynous stuff going on here because there are times when I'm listening to it and I sit there and go, is that a guy? Is it a girl? You know, and, and there's something, and I can't put quite put my finger on it or may not be describing it quite well, but there's something a little hypnotic about his music and it's also sensual. And it's sensual in a, to me, kind of a strange, compelling way. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not attracted um, to the androgynous stuff, but there's just a real sensuality to this music. And I think I could see back how young people of that era, um, you know, with the freedoms that were emerging during that period, would have been quite captivated by this. You know, and me as an old man, um, you know, when I sat down, I actually started listening to this pretty seriously over the last week or so. I, I picked up on what I perceived to be that vibe. And I don't know whether I'm way off in left field. No, no, I think I, I think you're spot on on this. Yeah. yeah. So. so anyway, that that's my impressions of it. <clears throat> well, at this point, all I can do is echo some comments have already been made with the regard to the slider and, and t-rex but i uh when i went back to listen to this it had been many many years probably decades since i seriously listened to the album all the way through and i had this once upon a time had this in vinyl as i did electric warrior and uh <clears throat> you know they were big enough at the time i'm gonna say Saw them live uh, perform. It was an opening act to another big act. I believe it was 72, maybe the spring of 73. And we'll give D a minute to come back. There we're, yeah. there we're, there we're back. Okay. A little flashback moment there, D. <laughs> you, you locked up on us, D. You started to tell us about a, uh, <clears throat> about a concert you went to. Yeah, so... <clears throat> Myself and uh, the host of this great program, we attended the, uh, the T-Rex and I'll say it, Three Dog Night uh, show. And it was, uh, you know, we went there for T-Rex because I, I believe Bang a Gong was still on the charts. And I, I like Ride a White Swan and all that. And they, they did play a number of tunes from uh, the slider. And then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it, it was a really interesting period. Uh, those for me, after the slide, I, I lost interest in whatever Mark Bowen was doing because there's just so much going on. But uh, <clears throat> I think his songs and just I call it. Uh, yeah, he has sharp, you know, real traditionalist uh, rock bass. And it's almost like a I don't want to say a drone, but just enough riffs to keep you interested. But I always thought he was he was intentionally tongue-in-cheek and quirky with his lyrics it was like well okay <laughs> you know metal guru is it you yeah. I, I don't think there's any deep meaning in any of this no um, i don't think so that or he did so, too many drugs yeah some of my uh favorite songs in this are of course telegram sam ballrooms of mars and then you know the ballrooms of mars if you go back and listen to that song it's uh, maybe it was his attempt to do an American pie. You know, he drops all these little hints about. Yeah, he, he, drops, he does a lot of name dropping in that song. Yeah, yeah, yeah directly with Dylan and John Lennon and a few other things. Alan and, Freed, yeah. Alan Freed, yeah, the original DJ that turned rock and roll. And 
and, and all that. Uh, and I think it was kind of, I was struck to me, he was just in being intentionally quirky, intentionally tongue in cheek. But the music was just enough where you go, yeah, OK, um, <clears throat> because you couldn't listen to a song five or six minutes long with it. I thought some of his lyrics were uh, not just quirky. I don't know if he was trying to drop hints or whatever, but uh, Rabbit Fighter. I don't I can't recall, <laughs> at least in the classic rock era, <laughs> the title of a song that included Rabbit in it with the exception of White Rabbit. And uh, I, I just, uh, I, I think it's, it's been said, yeah, they're, they're kind of, um, you know, up-tempo, little groovy thing, but I, I didn't become a, a raging T-Rex fan, I, I don't think. But uh, aside from that, and, and once again, I, this is a little, just a pet peeve of mine is, at the time, I guess, British media, they can't wait to come up with a label for every little thing, you know, the British, you know, and glam, you know, what was glam rock? Okay. They, well, they threw a little makeup on their face. It's still rock and roll, you know, it's just, <clears throat> or as John Lennon put, he goes, it's just rock and roll with lipstick on it. So, but everybody's trying to go for an angle. I get it. And they're trying to, you know, say that they're decidedly different, but um, what little video footage I saw of them and I recall, he wore some flashy clothes, but I, I didn't see him all makeup up or anything. Maybe a little bit, but uh, he, he put he put he put glitter glitter on his face. Yeah, and you know I get it. Know. Maybe that's just a theatrical or his, thing. Or his big giant like I don't know ostrich feather. Uh, you know. Well, yeah, I I think uh, they would have turned it you know, maybe burlesque it. rock. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I th I, I really think I. It's it's hard to really define what what glam rock sounds like, you know, other than to say that it's just uh, you know back to basics, three card three chord rock and roll, you know, uh, just just very simple. But yeah. but I go back and look at some of the people that uh, that people say were glam rock and. And you know, and 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 the one that has made people people say Roxy Music was glam rock, Roxy, you know. I, but it, that's not a sound. It, it, it occurred to me that glam rock was more a it was it was more of a fashion thing than it was a uh, a musical thing, right? Right. Yes. I, I mean, this uh, this 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 is like the uh, T Rex was the iconic, you know. Uh, uh, glam rock founder then and Bowie Bowie got on to it and, and Bowie was the one who who actually kind of brought this to the United States and 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 uh uh made it bigger and then Bowie jumped in and 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 grabbed Lou Reed and grabbed Iggy Pop and brought them in and and things like right. that. So so Bowie Bowie is the one that really broke it in the United States but but T Rex is uh, people, you know, historians say that T-Rex is where it all started, you know, and, and, and the, and the music, uh, the music is, I mean, it, it's, it's very, it, it's varied musically. If you listen to some of these people that, that, that everybody says were glam rock, the music is, you know, it, it goes in a lot of different directions, but I think what it all comes down to is, is the is the, the 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 fashion and the glamour and what they were doing on stage, you know? You know, as far as American bands go, of course, you mentioned Reed and that. The one I think that would fall under glam rock would be the New York Dolls. The New know? York Dolls, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. that was, but that was again, like I say, that that was sort of that's more that's that's American glitter, right? Because that was that was that went to a much darker. Uh, a much darker right. place than than people like T Rex did, right? You know, and then you know, and then you could add into that Alice Cooper, Kiss, right, you know? right, right. And again, right. you know, the same thing. They were all both much darker. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, it it was interesting to see. Maybe you came across it that uh, one of Mark Boland's big influence and pop and mentors was Eddie Cochran. Um, of summertime blues frame. Right. Uh, he apparently patterned uh, some of his songs. Not, you know, it was maybe more inspirational, I guess. Um, simple riffs, 
um, you know, a few power chords here and there. That's uh, I mean, uh, there, there are two there are two words to me that describe this. It's riff. <laughs> Yep. And, it, and it's simplicity. Yeah. Simplicity and riffs. You know, it's like, you know, in basic and just and just basic back to basic rock and roll. That's what it is. That's all it is. Uh, another another band that, that was huge in England that, that were that were considered a glam rock band, but they but they cut, sort of predated this movement and they stuck around a lot longer after that, but they were right in the middle of it was uh, uh, Slade, a band called Slade. Oh, yes. Oh, Slade. Slade. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love Slade. They were, yeah, they were, they were huge in this. I, I saw Slade in concert uh, one time at the American Theater. Yeah, I remember that concert uh, that you and I went to, D. Was that at the St. Louis Arena? Who's at the Keel? Was it at Keel? I couldn't remember if it was the Keel or the St. Louis Arena. But I yeah, remember we were, that. We I, were yeah, fairly... I, went, I went to see T Rex, and I did. I and I remember that the T Rex was the opening act, and I went to see the opening act. Yeah. Uh, but I I couldn't remember who the headliner was, and you later reminded me that it was Three Dog Night, and I do kind of remember that, but I have no yeah. memory of 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 the Three Dog Night show. I just remember the T Rex show, and I re I remember being kind of disappointed i didn't think it was very good <laughs> oh you mean the whole show i didn't i didn't i i didn't think t-rex was very good at, at that yeah. it, it was and i think that had as much to do with this lousy sound system than the acoustics you know, yeah the, yeah the acoustics were just horrible um, yeah, it, it, yeah. I, I mean i thought three dog nights well vocally they sounded but obviously but i don't, uh, I, don't I have no memory of, of three dog night um, well, being there i just remember i probably i probably just kind of tuned out and sat through it and was saying okay let's get let's, let's get the hell out of here <laughs> that's probably how i was listening to the three dog night show right uh, yeah this was uh, uh i i did i did do deep dive into uh into t-rex uh at this time i went back and i uh, found so most of their albums as Tyrannosaurus Rex were out of print even by this point, at least in the United States. I couldn't find it, but I did. Uh, I did find a copy of, uh, I should have pulled that out of my collection because I still have it. I did find a copy of Beard of Stars, which was the uh, first album with uh, Mickey Finn. And the first album is T-Rex, which was just a duo, which is a Bolin and, and, uh, and Mickey Finn. I have that one. I listen to that quite a bit. And then Electric Warrior and the Slider. And, and then the follow-up, Tanks, in 1973, I was a big fan of when that came out. But that was that was now Bolin starting to uh, spread his wings a little bit. Tanks, was, he got more into, uh, he started doing a little more rhythm and blues and uh, bringing that in. And uh, and then after that is when uh, basically T-Rex broke up and then it just became, for a few years, it just became a, a Mark Bolin project for three or four years. And, and, and they disappeared from the United States. <laughs> you know, we never heard anything more from the United States. So I lost track of them after Tanks, but I, I, I was in on Tanks. And that was, that was, that was, I, I liked that record a lot too. Uh, yeah, this is just... Uh, if you know, if you just want something to something to dance to, shake your hips to, this this is a place to go. It's it's pretty infectious. Uh, you start listening to it, and it does get under your skin. As 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 a good rock and roll, uh, just just you know, just just good rhythm section and a lot of a lot of guitar riffs and a, and a lot of good uh, uh, flowing Eddie background vocals. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think there was a lot more to T-Rex's music than, and I don't know who said you can connect the dots from their stuff to early punk. Most of punk, with the exception of the Ramones, to me, is pretty disposable stuff. And T-Rex is, is much more musical and obviously listenable. I think, um, I think going back to the New York Dolls, New York Dolls are kind of that bridge. The New York Dolls were kind of that bridge to me between uh, between the glam rock of uh, 
of T Rex and then uh, and then and then the punk movement later. The New York Dolls were kind of there, right? Right between they were the stepping stone from from T Rex to uh, the Sex Pistols, right? <laughs> okay. Um, faithful viewers by now have probably picked up that I'm a lover of trivia and I like finding obscure things and researching this I came across something that I thought was kind of interesting and I'd like to share it real quickly um, there's a deep cut on this album called Baby Boomerang and I discovered that Baby Boomerang became the basis for a plot to one of the episodes to an old 70s TV show called uh, Cannon, which had William Conrad in it, and it was a detective series, and I remember watching it as a teenager. And um, so the plot to it, and I don't remember ever seeing this episode, but anyway, the plot to it is there's, there's this zonked out guy who's muttering the lyrics from Baby Boomerang, <laughs> and Cannon, you know, who's this middle-aged private eye, winds up calling a hip radio station to try to get an idea of what this guy's talking about. <laughs> And the lyrics that he's muttering from the song are mince pie dog eye, eagle on the wind. I'm searching through this garbage looking for a friend. And now preceding those lyrics, um, it goes uh, baby boomerang, baby boomerang. You never spike a person, but you always bang the whole gang. So I find it kind of bizarre that they would have done a 70s TV episode around that song and those lyrics, especially Bang the Whole Gang. So I just thought that was kind of interesting piece of trivia. And I wanted to close out with that. Cannon, Cannon was the was the fat detective, right? Right, well, back, he, right um, back in the, back in those days, they had all these all these weekly detective shows. Quinn Martin and uh, yes. you know a couple of other guys, Stephen Cannell, and and, and all the and, and and they were all detective shows, and they're basically the same sort of plot, you know. <laughs> and and uh, but every detective had its own had its own personality. Like Cannon was a fat detective uh, who. Uh, the the guy who who played Perry Mason, he was a wheelchair. Ironside, Ironside was the was the detective wheelchair. In a wheelchair and, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they all had their gimmick. And they I remember gimmick, yeah. uh, Cannon had the huge Lincoln Continental with a car phone. You know, which was like <laughs> really something unusual back then. But anyway, you know, I just thought it was kind of an interesting thing that that, that somebody was hip in Hollywood to pull this deep cut <laughs> off that album and build an episode of a TV mystery sh detective show around. Probably a couple of the writers on the Canon TV series were maybe they were T Rex fans. Oh, they they had toked up a little bit too much and said, "Hey, man, this would be cool." So, and somehow it got past the the network. So, I'm, I may have to go see if I can't find that on YouTube or something just to watch it for the heck of it. That's... Okay, gang. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, Come back with us next week. We're we're going to uh, I'll listen to Neil Young's new album, which was just released. Uh, what is today? The twelfth. So yeah, it was released uh, two days ago on the tenth. And I've I've had a chance to listen to a couple of three tracks from it. I haven't listened to the whole thing yet. But anyway, uh, uh, D Bob and I will be back next week to talk about new Neil Young's new album, The Barn. Uh, we'll be back on Friday with a. Uh, review what is scheduled this week on our reviews i forget oh uh the morning show where bob and i did a review of the morning show the apple tv plus uh series so that'll be this friday next wednesday will be the uh, uh the neil young album barn and give us a like subscribe to us and thanks for joining us everybody we'll talk to you later all right